Welcome to episode 20 of the Visionary Investor Podcast. Today I'm going to break apart the S&P 500 and wait until you see what's going on behind the scenes here. So in front of me I have a breakdown of the S&P 500 that I did back in January and one that I just completed as of yesterday. The risk adjusted return of the S&P 500 over the past five years of historical data is less than one based on downside standard deviation. The way this is calculated is the Sortina ratio is the annualized return minus the risk-free rate divided by the risk. In January, the risk-free rate using the three-month treasury bill or T-bill was 4.58. In October, as of the date of this report, the three-month T-bill is 5.35%, a difference of about 77 basis points between the January report and this October report. That definitely has made some minor tweaks in what companies will be on this list or not. As of this January report, the Sortino ratio was 0.26. And as of this report in October, the risk adjusted return of the S&P 500, 0.23. So what is this really saying? It's showing that with investing the S&P 500, based on just looking at data of historical annualized return and downside risk, there is more risk than return in the S&P 500. Now, yes, depending on when you've gotten in and out, you could make 6%, 7%, 8%, 10%, 11% in the S&P 500, but you obviously also could lose money in the S&P 500 if you invest during a bad time frame, get worried, panic, and sell. This is why you'll hear me stress, you can't perfectly time the market but you can find better timing because even investing in something which people have looked at as very stable and historically make about eight, 10% returns with the S&P 500, but you also could lose money investing in the S&P 500 if you've invested during a recession, for instance, and got really scared that a million dollars turned into $800,000. So what I did for both reports is I looked at the top 75% of the index. So back in January, I noticed that 143 of the 504 companies or holdings rather in the S&P 500 accounted for 75.06% of the index. So that means 28.4% of holdings account for 75% of the entire S&P 500. That means there's a lot of small, small companies with 0.1, 0.2, or even less percent of the weight of the S&P 500 because it's based on market cap. Now, fast forward to October of 2023, 123 of 505 holdings accounted for 75.2% of the index. Now that's 24.4%. Only 123 stocks were required to make about 75% of the weight of the S&P 500 versus previously 143 stocks. And what's also interesting to note is the US dollar holding back in January was 0.06 and the holding in October is 0.4. That's a pretty big difference there. So let's take a look of the breakdown here. The top 20 largest companies in January accounted for 33.7% of the index now in October account for 41.9% of the index. The top 10 largest companies accounted for 23.9% of the index as of January and as of October of this year account for 31.7% of the index. So because the S&P 500 is a market weighted index, what's really happening here is the larger companies are outperforming and because of that, their market cap is generally increasing and that's why they're taking up a larger percentage share of the S&P 500. So what I did in the January report is what I did in this October report. I looked to see out of those 143 companies in January, how many of them had greater than one risk adjusted return using the Sortino ratio. So that's based on downside standard deviation. And at the time, we had a risk-free rate of 4.58%. And there were 18 companies that followed these two characteristics, greater than one Sorrentino ratio and less than 20% risk based on downside standard deviation. We're looking at five years worth of data. That report was from December of 2017 through December of 2022. This report about nine months later is covering from September of 2018 through September of 2023. The reason for that is because I'm taking 
month-end data. It's companies like Tesla, which has clearly outperformed, but the risk has been greater than 20%. Fast forward to this report in October, we're looking at only nine companies had greater than one Sortina ratio and less than 20% risk. There were five companies on this list that were pretty close, but I really like to look at that 1.0 Sortina ratio as my cutoff. You really wanna see if those companies work with your specific goals. And if when you do projections, on those companies, if you still think in five years, 10 years, 15 years, those are gonna still be strong companies. Because what's really interesting is if I look at a company that was on the list in January and now is not on the list, Dollar General. Year to date, Dollar General is down 55%. Previously, they fell into that criteria, a greater than one Sortino ratio and less than 20% risk over the past five years. So when we break things down, we notice that 7.3% of the top 123 holdings had a greater than one Sortino ratio and less than 20% risk based on October of 2023. But the previous report in January, 12.6% of the top 143 holdings had a risk adjusted return or Sortino ratio above one and less than 20% risk. So what are we noticing here? There are definitely companies that have stayed on the list. There's companies that were not on the list and now are on the list. So there's been a bunch of different changes with this. In my opinion, this is just a great start for your research. And I'm just being really strict with, all right, it has to be 1.0 because I'm looking here, there's two companies on here that are 0.99. I did not include them in this report because they really were not above that 1.0 threshold, but that's just being strict for the purpose of giving exact calculations. You look at a company like Costco, which previously was on the list. Now it's not on the list because the Sortino ratio is 0.94. Costco has outperformed. I mean, we're looking at 19.2% annualized returns over the past five years with 14.8% risk. What I would do is take this information, dive deeper into these companies, dive deeper into the research, the fundamental analysis, management analysis. See if these companies align with your goals. If you're interested in getting the research behind this list and seeing this full list, I do share it in one of our memberships which you can access in the link in the description. So what am I trying to say here? Only 7.3% of the top 123 holdings, which make up 75.2% of the S&P 500, actually had a risk adjusted return greater than one and less than 20% risk. I don't like seeing companies that have more than 20% risk based on downside standard deviation because what happens here, we notice there's a lot of fluctuations on the downside and take a listen to episode number 19 if you wanna understand more about those return distributions and that risk level, the correlations compared to the S&P 500 and compared to the other stocks in those indexes. Definitely a good lesson. When I'm looking at the stock market, I like to look at consistency. And of course, the next five years are not always gonna look like the past five years, but we wanna see that leaders are properly managing the companies, that we're noticing performance increasing year over year. And if there's drastic differences over the past five years, 10 years, and the next five years in risk levels, is that something we could have predicted or is that something we really don't know about? I think the closer you pay attention to risk adjusted return using Sortino ratio and tweak it, make it your own, the better ability you'll have to more accurately predict stock prices over the next five years and 10 years. And the reason for this is because it tells you a lot. I'm looking here at a company like Deer up until the January report, they had an annualized return of 22.3%. They had 16.3% downside risk and the Sortina ratio is 1.1. Now, if we look to this report, they just were on the cusp of making this list, but they, they didn't. Their annualized return 20.2%, the risk 15.7% and Sortina ratio 0.95. And guess what? Year to date, they're down about 10.3%. If we look at the five-year return, they're up about 161%. So take this information, try to understand, all right, why is there a change in a company like Deer? Are they still fundamentally strong? Did they just have a few bad quarters? What's going on behind the scenes? So you can take this information and this knowledge to do a further analysis. When I look at this again in the next five years and compare it to the previous five years, I'm gonna see a different picture. We're all gonna see a different picture because some companies are gonna stay true to these numbers and some companies are gonna completely be off. A company that was on the list in January and is now not 
is Elevance Health. And what's interesting about it is if I'm looking at the numbers here, I see the annualized return was 17.9% over the past five years as of the January report with an 11.7% risk and a 1.15 Sortino ratio. So just over that one mark now, because they've been down about 10% year to date, their annualized return about 9.7%, their risk 12%, so risk hasn't changed that much. But as a result of this and the higher three month T-bill, they now have a risk adjusted return or Sortino ratio of 0.36. And that's obviously a big difference to happen in just a nine month period. The next nine months, the next five years may look completely different, but I'd wanna dive into this and see, all right, is this something that's gonna continuously happen where they're gonna drop even more and more and more over the next three years, five years? Or was there just a big catalyst that caused the company's stock price to fall over the past nine months and is something which maybe is cyclical, maybe is what's going on in the economy right now, and we'll notice a difference. And that's where you wanna really do your research and your homework because just because a company has performed well in the past obviously does not mean it's gonna perform well in the future based on risk adjusted return, based on different characteristics of the company, and it's important to do your research. I'll continue to stress this. Even if you have a financial advisor, do your research. So based on these nine months of time, what we've noticed is the larger companies, because the S&P 500 is based on market cap, have actually performed fairly well over these past nine months, but there's a lot of other companies who have not. Looking at nine months of time is not a significant amount of time because any of the companies that maybe aren't on this list anymore could be back on it in two months, five months, or a year. But what's important is these fundamental backbones behind what we're seeing, behind why has the annualized return dropped from 20% down to 5% or become negative. When we're noticing these large shifts, when we're looking at things from a past five year time period, and then we notice all right, Dollar General's stock price has dropped in half or even more than half. Well, that gets you to question, all right, if I'm gonna invest into that company, is that a company that has strong fundamentals? This is a place you can start with your screener. Take this information, take it to the next step, really dive deep into the company's financial metrics, where they're operating, what do their supplier vendor concentrations look like? What are they doing to stay a market leader? How well are they marketing their products and services? Are they spending way too much money and not getting a great ROI? What does their ROA and ROE look like? Are they showing EPS growth year over year? And if they're not, is it due to a specific line of business that is not performing well? Or is the main operations of the company actually struggling? We look at a company like IBM and we look at the history of IBM. IBM stock over the past five years has only been up 12.29%. And in fact, since 1983, I'm looking here at a chart of IBM, it's only up 340% in approximately a 40 year time period. IBM has a market cap right now of $126 billion. Just because a company is large does not actually mean that their stock has outperformed the market or done extremely well as it is. It's important to dive deep into the details. Understand, all right, where has this company made mistakes in the past? And based on their current leadership, based on how they're operating, based on what their financials look like, do we believe that in the future they're going to continue to make these mistakes or they're gonna pivot, become visionary, become more of a leader, come out with new products or services that just completely dominate the market? Just because a company's stock price has been falling doesn't mean they're not a great company. They just may not be a great investment for you, for your portfolio, and for what you're looking to try to do to protect your wealth and create generational legacies. I've said this before and I'm gonna to continue to stress it. If you have any industry expertise or knowledge, use that to your advantage when you're investing into the stock market. You'll have a better understanding of the companies you're investing into if you're using that knowledge. And use your regular life experience. For instance, let's say you've recently walked into Nike and you've noticed that they really have made a big shift in the past five years in the products, the quality, the prices, and you love it or you hate it. Take that information and use that to your advantage. Nothing stops you before investing in a company to do that market research and actually go, go visit five stores, 10 stores, 
Speak to people who work there. See how they like it. Check out how different stores operate. See what you feel, the energy you get from walking into that company's store or that location if they're not an actual retail company. Maybe we're talking about a hotel chain. How do you feel when you're there? How does that compare to a different hotel chain? Use this life knowledge to find the best stocks for you. This is how you're gonna secure an optimal diversified stock portfolio. And it just takes three to seven strong individual stocks in different sectors to target 20 plus percent annualized returns with a low level of risk. And when you find those companies that work well together rather than fall at the same time, this is how you maximize your returns and minimize your risk to protect your wealth and truly amplify your impact and change your life. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Please make sure you rate, subscribe, and like the podcast and continue listening everywhere you get your podcasts. The video versions are available on YouTube and Spotify. Have a great day.